Welcome to the Path to Understanding podcast. Today, we'll be sharing wisdom from our neighborhood with Nina Fernando from Shoulder to Shoulder. Our mission at Path to Understanding is to bridge bias and build unity through multi-faith peacemaking. As we begin, I want to acknowledge that I am standing on the traditional land of Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Samish and the Swinomish. We honor with gratitude the land itself, the people who lived upon and cared for it since time immemorial, and we commit to working for a better, more just world together. Today, we're so pleased to have with us Nina Fernando, who serves as Executive Director at the Shoulder to Shoulder Campaign, a multi-faith coalition of organizations committed to countering and preventing anti-Muslim discrimination and violence in the United States by building a society where all are treated with dignity and respect. She first joined Shoulder to Shoulder uh, team in 2017. Nina holds a Master's of Arts in Interreligious and Cultural Studies from Claremont School of Theology and a Bachelor of Arts in Social Change through Music and Religious Studies from the Johnson Center of Integrative Studies at the University of Redlands. Nina's intersectional identities have informed her work as a multi-faith community organizer, activist, vocalist, and songwriter. Nina lives in Southern California with her husband, the Reverend Noel Anderson, and their toddler, Ayan, who I had an excellent time sharing some French fries with at a, uh, at a uh, airport in Grand Rapids, Michigan, a few months ago. So Nina, we're so happy to have you join us. It's great to be with you. So, so shoulder to shoulder, we, we were founded in 2010. Um, and if you remember at the time, uh, there was a spike in anti-Muslim rhetoric in the public sphere. Uh, there were conversations around the so-called so Ground Zero Mosque uh, in, in New York. And there was a pastor in Florida threatening to burn the Quran. And, and at the time, religious leadership had really strong relationships um, at the national level with an organization called the Islamic Society of North America. And uh, a, a few leaders convened um, and uh, in 2010, and they called an emergency interfaith summit. Um, there were about 40 groups uh, present that day at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. So this press conference um, was, was widely publicized. It was on C-SPAN and a number of, of, of networks. Um, and really, it was this call uh, uh, of solidarity. Um, there, there, the, a statement, a central statement that people convened and gathered around was, you know, really an attack on one is an attack on all. Um, and at the time, you know, religious leaders at the national level, they, they, they said, what can we do? You know, uh, how can we support the Muslim community in this time, um, specifically um, as, as this anti-Muslim rhetoric is, is, is at a spike, at a high. Um, and, and so what was a, a press conference uh, became an organization and a coalition um, that Shoulder to Shoulder is today. And we, um, we have a, a national a coalition of 36 uh, religious denominations and faith-based organizations, about 72 uh, community organizations, uh, faith-based, interfaith, and, and just community organizations and congregations um, at the local level. And that includes uh, Paths to Understanding. And we have thousands of, of faith leaders and, and people of faith and, and people that are connected at the local level to our work in some capacity. And really what makes us unique, our niche, if you will, is that we're helping non-Muslims see this as their issue too, um, because it is only then that, that we'll make a real impact on this issue. So, so that's a little bit of our story and our background. And, and we see our work and, and we, we kind of think of our work in three buckets. We connect, we equip, and we mobilize uh, faith leaders, faith communities, uh, people of conscience um, to really step into uh, what, it, what it means to be an, an ally, a multi-faith ally in this work um, of countering anti-Muslim discrimination in the United States. So, you know, I know a lot of folk um, in the public, you know, think that uh, anti-Muslim bigotry sort of came on the scene and 2015 and 2016, you know, with uh, some political candidates really, you know, raising the rhetoric, and certainly there there wasn't an increase at that point to some degree in terms of public consciousness, right? But um, and then some people, because they think that's when it started, they think that 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 uh, when Joe Biden was elected as president, then anti-Muslim bigotry ended, right? At that point, right? So 
in, in your in your experience uh, and with all your knowledge, what is the current state of anti-Muslim bigotry in the United States right now? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll even say that that oftentimes people think that that anti-Muslim discrimination, you know, popped up and came into the sphere in the United States after 9-11. Yes, that's right. And that's, that's also a, a common assumption, but but really it's a problem that existed long before, um, unfortunately, and it's a problem that's really wrapped up in white supremacy and, and white Christian nationalism and imperialism, and, and both of which are unfor unfortunately not new to our story here in our nation, you know, given the history of the murdering and the, the displacement of indigenous communities, um, you know, of slavery and segregation, you know, the list can go on. And so unfortunately, anti-Muslim discrimination is not new um, to the country. And, you know, even today, you know, we're, we're still mourning all the lives lost uh, from gun violence, um, you know, in Uvalde, Texas, and, and just days after the Buffalo, New York shooting, um, where, where really a notable, uh, pe pe many don't know this, but a notable percentage of the Buffalo, New Yorker, uh, shooter's Manifesto uh, was plagiarized from the Christchurch Shooter's Manifesto. And, and you know, one shooter targeted a, a Black community and killed 10, and another shooter targeted the Muslim community in two houses of worship and killed 51 uh, Muslims. Um, and so, so, you know, both were clearly motivated by, by white supremacy. Um, and so, you know, that, that's unfortunate, an unfortunate reality of today that it's all interconnected. You know, Islamophobia, anti-Muslim discrimination is very much connected to racism and, and anti-Jewish anti hate, you know, uh, all the different isms um, that, that we are facing. And Islamophobia and anti-Muslim discrimination is also very much a well-funded campaign. It's a dehumanizing campaign. Um, and it impacts not just the fringes of society, but, but all of us, you know, in, in, in our mainstream public sphere, we see, you know, we're bombarded by negative images um, of Islam and Muslims, unfortunately. There, there was a study that, that looked at the New York Times uh, over the course of 25 years, and it found that Islam and Muslims were portrayed more negatively than cancer and cocaine. Uh, you know, it, it, this is in the New York Times, you know, there, um, you know, a few years ago, an organization called the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, an incredible organization that I totally recommend people checking out. Um, they, they do research on the American Muslim community specifically, but also as it relates to other communities um, um, here in the United States. And they, they did a report that analyzed 15 years of, of data um, regarding, um, uh, you know, for example, violent incidents um, and, and plots in the United States. And uh, what they found is perceived Muslims accused of, of formulating a violent plot received seven times more media coverage than others accused of similar plots. So, so it's, you know, we're, we're seeing more coverage of, of Muslims, you know, committing or, or plotting uh, a, a crime, um, you know, rather than, than, than those, than others, you know, essentially. So we're just essentially bombarded with negative images. You know, there's, there's more to this report, you know, uh, per, uh, perpetrators who are perceived to be Muslim receive two times the media coverage as other perpetrators of the violent, of violent incidences that are similar. Um, you know, there's um, a systemic issue. The, the average prison sentences are four times higher for perpetrators who are perceived to be Muslim. Uh, government agencies issued press releases or made statements, uh, you know, from their national offices six times as often um, in, in regards to violent plots by Muslim perceived perpetrators than violent plots by non-Muslim perceived per per perpetrators. So, you know, articles about Muslim perceived perpetrators were twice as likely to reference terror, the words terror or extreme, while articles about non-Muslim perpetrators were more likely to refer reference hate. So, you know, um, even the word terrorism, you know, we're, we're, we're talking a lot about that now as we're reckoning with, with gun violence. Um, but, you know, this, this evidence, this, this research shows that, that our, our brains are associating the word terrorism with a certain community and, and our, you know, our minds are associating that. And, and when, when we look at the data, when we look at the research, White supremacy and, and acts of violence committed by white supremacists, that's the biggest threat to our country um, in, in terms of 
uh, terrorism, if you will. And so, so we often actually avoid that word because of, of the associations that our minds have made because of this very successful campaign, um, as I mentioned, the Islamophobia and anti-Muslim discrimination campaign. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm going on and on about all the negativity. And I also want to name in this current state of affairs, how much good there is. There are so many people and so many organizations like you all at Paths to Understanding, among many, um, who who are, are 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 fighting back against this and are really pushing um, to uplift communities coming together, um, getting to know one another, um, and and pushing back against the dehumanization that is taking place. And you know, uh, we we know that that you know, as I mentioned, Islamophobia is not new to our American story, nor nor is our people pushing back. That's not new to our American story. You know, uh, we we are connected to um, uh, movements and leaders um, who are really pushing back and and who are doing good um, in their communities. And so, I just want to name that as well, and and also name that you know, anti-Muslim discrimination doesn't just impact Muslims. It, it impacts those who are perceived to be Muslim. It impacts um, like the Sikh community, for example, you know, South Asians, uh, people of color, black and brown communities, you know, um, and, and it's, it's, it's a moving target. So really it impacts us all. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I want to name all the good that's happening because, you know, they're, they're, that is also a part of our story and, and a part of what you know, what our legacy, what, what shoulder to shoulder is about. Um, and I know what you all at Paths to Understanding is about. You know, Nina, so I, I, um, I think a lot of times, you know, um, folk just really underestimate the way that uh, associating a community with negative things um, actually impacts the community and it impacts the person who's receiving receiving the message, right? So um, just out on an island, uh, not very far from here, um, a young Turkish Muslim woman um, had was looking for a babysitter for her two-year-old daughter and uh, got a person that was recommended to her. And she could kind of tell the person's face twitched when the person found out she was Muslim. Um, uh, when, when she didn't want the, her baby to be fed pork, for instance. And, uh, and what ended up happening was that because of some of the, the messaging of the anti-Muslim hate groups, you know, way back in like 2013, 2014, around associating Muslims with a, a certain form of, 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 uh, of genital cutting, which is not an Islamic practice, right? Um, and that that's gotten woven into the QAnon movement. And so this QAnon believing uh, babysitter and a friend actually violated this little girl by inspecting her private parts and then turning the mother into Homeland Security. And then what that has done is, is create a lot of tension in that community. But just as you said, it's also done something kind of, there's also been a beautiful response because over a hundred people and a whole bunch of organizations are standing with that, uh, with that American Muslim woman and her family um, after this, this terrible tragedy happened. But these kind of lies, the kind of slander that is spoken against American Muslims, well, it, it actually tears communities apart. It tears families apart. It helps us to, to decrease in our trust uh, in each other and in our community. And, uh, and so, you know, those hate groups, of course, as you know, they, they research, you know, what words and phrases, you know, scare people. And, and they spend a lot of money, and it's hard to even know how much money they're spending now because of some of the changes in federal law. Uh, but um, these groups aren't just tearing us, tearing, uh, tearing down American Muslims, they're tearing our communities apart. I, I, I did hear about that story and it was so hard to read uh, just thinking you know as a, yeah. as a as a mother myself and and what that would have felt like um I, I just can't imagine and and i appreciate you you naming you know the the that there are people that are pushing back that are coming together yeah. um i just i think that that's that's key here you know hate and fear um are very much powerful mo no mobilizers 
Um, and we see that on this issue among many. Yeah. And just as just at the, as as we name that, we also know that that love and community and our values and our morals, you know, our ideals as a nation and within our faith traditions, you know, all of that, that's also a very, very powerful motivator. And, and really, that's what we need to uplift. That's what we need to work on. Yeah, amen. So we we just, just want you to know, we just had, held a, uh, a Zoom conversation for people on the island on Monday night um, with, uh, with uh, Farah herself, you know, being a, a leader of that conversation, and also uh, an Indigenous elder named Kay that I've been doing a lot of work with uh, here. And it's, it was really a nice a nice evening, and you could see that people were recognizing the power of that kind of solidarity, right? But you know, kind of thinking of, about our our listeners here, you know, again, who who can kind of say, well, all right, you know, so there's this there's this anti-Muslim rhetoric, there's these hate groups that are messaging and and constantly bombarding us. We've got politicians using anti-Muslim bigotry, you know, to divide us and to try to get, gain votes. Um, you know, there's all these factors at play in the media as well, and kind of the national narrative that we tell. But, you know, yeah, that just impacts Muslims. I mean, so, you know, why should we, the rest of us care about that? Like, what do you, what do you say when you get that question? Gosh, I, I think I answer that question in a different way, depending on, on who, who I'm with, yeah. you know, but, but, I, I think it all comes down to our values, I think. And um, as I mentioned, and, I'm, and I might mention again, you know, Islamophobia, anti-Muslim discrimination, it's a dehumanizing campaign. It's trying and attempting to, for us to dehumanize our neighbors. And it's trying to paint an entire community as a monolith as X, Y, Z, and, 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 and we all know no community is a monolith. There's so much diversity and difference, uh, di you know, whatever community you name, whether that be another faith community, Christians, you know, whether that be, um, you know, an ethnic group, you know, there, there's just so much diversity, no community is a monolith. And, and so, uh, you know, I think that is key and and that's why we should care about this if we're not muslim you know i i come from a sri lankan catholic background and and i was born and raised here in the united states and i i remember growing up you know feeling feeling like i wasn't good enough the color of my skin wasn't good enough um you know and and i i feel like that feeling uh, like you don't belong, like like because of who you are, you are not good enough. Um, in in our home, in our country, uh, you know that that's what many of our fellow Muslim neighbors are feeling, you know, due to this rhetoric and you know the impact that that it has on on them. Uh, you know, when you're constantly seeing negative portrayals of your people, people who might look like your your, yourself, um, you know, um, let alone, you know, people don't realize how diverse the American Muslim community is, you know, um, oftentimes people who are not Muslim assume Muslims look a certain way. And, and actually that that's, you know, especially in America, such an incredibly diverse community, um, uh, racially and ethnically. So, so, you know, I, I just wanted to, to name the, the, the feelings of, of, you know, growing up feeling like I don't belong and how there are so many young people, but even adults that are being made to feel like they don't belong. And that, again, go, when we go back to our values, that, that goes against my values um, and of, of, of creating communities of belonging, of welcome, of hospitality. These are all, you know, really important to me and I know are important to, to others. Um, and so, so really reflecting on our values and what's important to us, whether that be community, safety, uh, you know, all, all of these things and applying that to all of us, to all of our neighbors and, and you know, whether or not we acknowledge it. We are a, a, a very, very much a multi-faith, multicultural, multi-everything community here. And we're interacting with each other without perhaps knowing about our differences and our diversity, um, uh, whether that be our faith tradition or our cultural background um, or what have you. Um, and, and, and so, so, you know, 
it, it impacts us all essentially. You know, I, I, I speak a lot in, you know, slightly more rural areas, you know, where there aren't many Muslims, right? So, you know, folk are, are saying, well, why, you know, why are you talking about this? You know, um, this isn't that big a deal. And, but, you know, you just mentioned earlier that ISPU report, you know, um, I believe it's called Equal Treatment, um, and it's available on the, uh, at ISPU.org. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's not a long document, but it really teaches a lot. And, and so when, when people who are perceived to be Muslims are, are, are uh, sentenced, they receive longer sentences than people who are doing equal kinds of crimes who are not perceived to be Muslim. Well, that's, that's a, a indirect violation of the 14th Amendment, which is equal protection under the law. And, and so and we have other other uh, rights uh, of in our in our kind of aspirational constitution, you know, which we've never lived out uh, fully, right at all. But um, you know, such as freedom to pray or not pray as you wish. Um, and so what I what I try to do is I try to go back to those like aspirational constitutional values with people and and remind them that the human rights are not a limited good. There's not just so much to go around. And if uh, if religious freedom, if if freedom of speech, if freedom to assemble, um, if if uh, due process of law, if those values aren't lived out for one group, then we all all of our rights get diminished in that moment. And that it's up to the majority folk in the community to to really stand up for the minority groups in the, in that in that moment, because that's how we protect all of our rights. And and that argument, you know, really does does is pretty effective with a lot of folk and i on monday night i told the, the the people um you know on the zoom and i was out to speak to two churches about a month ago uh to kind of rally them to to stand you know with with farah and her family and uh, and i just said look it's your responsibility as the majority religious communities you know on the island to stand with your american muslim neighbors and that's not extra credit work like that is you do that. That is you living out of your tradition. That's you living out of your own personal experiences, whatever they are. That's you living out, you know, what it means to be an American citizen in this time, you know. And 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 so and so that's on you. And I, you could see them all go, "Yep, that's on us." And that was such a lovely moment, you know, to see that Nina when people just said, "Yeah, that's us. We're going to do that," and they and they are. I love that. I love that. So true. So, um, so Nina, like, so th there's this anti-Muslim hate group stuff that we, we have the politicians who always around April or May of every year start up the anti-Muslim bigotry. You know, we have, uh, you know, we have, you know, so much uh, negative, negative stuff. And, and then obviously some of that stuff sticks in all of us, right? I, I am still confronting some of the anti-Muslim bigotry I have within me. It's just a, an ongoing journey. Uh, but what are some of the strategies that Shoulder to Shoulder uses and tries to engage uh, to counter this uh, discrimination and bigotry and help build the kind of society that we all long for? Sure. So, so I'll just share some of the examples of what we do. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier our, our kind of three categories of work, our buckets of work. Um, we connect, we equip, and we mobilize. So with connecting, uh, we, we, we think these are all important strategies and they all fit together in different ways. And one is not more important than the other. Um, um, so, so with connecting, you know, we, we um, every Ramadan, um, which is uh, the holy month of Ramadan for Muslims, uh, many Muslims fast um, from just before sun up to sundown, and they come together for uh, a meals to break that fast, and that those meals are called iftars. And um, for the for the past few years, shoulder to shoulder has created a nationwide listing of interfaith iftars or iftars open to interfaith guests to really just encourage very simply, you know, uh, people coming together and sharing a meal with each other, getting to know their Muslim neighbors and taking part in this, this beautiful tradition, um, break bread at the table together. And uh, we've grown that list um, from uh, in, in the years, you know, since we've, we started doing this. And, and uh, you know, 
uh, in 2019, which is when we, we last created this nationwide listing of in-person iftars, you know, as we all, we all shifted um, in the pandemic, uh, right. we had 530 iftars listed in 39 states. And we know there are so many more, you know, than we were able to capture. And so wanting to tell this story, this American story of people coming together and sharing meals during Ramadan and getting to know their Muslim neighbors. Uh, um, since the pandemic, what we what we did is we, we shifted to uh, what we called our Welcome to My Table initiative, and we paired households with one another. So we, we captured some information about, about each household and then tried to intentionally pair households, you know, if it's a family with young children or, uh, you know, maybe an interfaith couple or a bunch of roommates, you know, um, and, and trying to intentionally pair um, uh, households to build connections. Uh, we, we created a virtual listing um, in 2019. We actually went on a Ramadan road trip and visited uh, the, some five iftars in the American Southeast. And, and uh, that, a, a part of that, we created a, a mini doc and a series of videos that, that you can find online. But, uh, you know, a part of that goal was to also show the diversity of the American Muslim community and how, how a different communities are coming together. Some were smaller, community-led, uh, more organic um, um, uh, gatherings, and some were, you know, hosted at the, like in Nashville, at the uh, convention center and was, you know, help, par partially, if not fully funded by the city and the mayor was there, you know, like, so, so, so really it was um, uh, uh, awesome to see the diversity and, and um, the ways in which people come together. Um, Atlanta in the center of the park led by a, a, a black Muslim uh, led organization, which was really amazing to see, um, uh, you know, everyone pray out in the park at sundown, just gorgeous in Atlanta. Um, so, Anyways, connection, uh, building connection and building relationships um, with each other and encouraging those connections. We um, every month host uh, a call um, for our community network members. And it's really just a chance for people who are doing this work in their own communities to, 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 to remember that they are not doing this alone and in isolation, that they have partners, thought partners around the country to, to share ideas, work through challenges, um, and, and really uh, be in community with each other and, and you know, sharing resources and ideas um, um, that's relevant to this work. So connection, we think, is key, um, you know, and that might also look like people starting book clubs and dialogue groups and, and what have you. And so we think all of that is so important. Um, the, the second is to equip equipping communities. And so we, um, for the past few years, and, and, and thanks to, to you, Terry, um, and, and your leadership too, at the, at the very beginning, we've been hosting these Faith Over Fear trainings um, in different parts of the country and virtually now. Um, and, and what they are are four parts, understanding ourselves and our motivations for the work, uh, what is anti-Muslim discrimination and Islamophobia? How does it show up in society? Um, what are all the different aspects of it? And we just skim the surface, uh, very, very much skim the surface. Um, and then what's core to the training is messaging and communicating in a way that moves people, in a way that doesn't reinforce negative stereotypes and uh, really uh, allows uh, uh, folks to get the tools to talk about the common myths and misperceptions and tropes about Islam and Muslims um, to, to move people. And so we, we've um, created with, with partner organizations some, some best practices for having those conversations and we, and we, we practice them. And, and so um, uh, that's really key. And then finally, strategies. Um, we we um, highlight strategies of that uh, organizations and leaders that are doing this work at the, the grassroots level um, and, and, and giving folks ideas of what they can do in their own context um, and, and, and kind of letting people essentially um, decide and create a plan um, of what works best for their context. So, so this training is key, um, but, but we also have hosted workshops and partnered with other organizations to host workshops, create toolkits, webinars, um, you know, um, talking points, 
um, you know, whatever it is that that might be needed in, in a particular moment or, or a, a tool that can be useful and practical, um, we, we hope to be able to give that out. And, and something we also hope to do, too, is if we don't have it or we don't uh, know of, of it ourselves, we can point people to other organizations who do. Um, and so, so that's something that, that is key, you know, equipping and letting people know that, that it's an ongoing process of learning. You don't have to be an expert, uh, you know, to, to recognize the humanity of your neighbors. Um, and so, so, um, you know, giving folks the tools to, to be, to, to, to start essentially wherever they are, um, and then finally mobilize. Um, and that looks very different depending on the context. It might be a sign on letter or a press statement or, 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 or a, a conference, you know, convening. Um, it might be, um, you know, pushing back or supporting a particular policy or piece of legislation. Um, it might be um, writing up opinion editorials just this past spring. Uh, we worked on a, a spring 2022 messaging campaign because um, a number of religious holidays, and including Ramadan, Passover, and Easter, among others, um, uh, intervened and 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 uh, um, converged in a way that it hasn't in over 30 years. And and we just thought that that was an incredible opportunity to to not not only build religious literacy and 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 understanding of, of, of our own traditions as it as it is in connection with others, but also to name that we haven't applied our values as a country, religious freedom, um, you know, religious liberty, um, uh, among others, um, evenly to all people. Um, and and so so naming where we've fallen short. Um, and so we created a messing, messaging guide and we encouraged uh, people to write public messages, whether that be in the form of an opinion um, editorial or in a sermon or in a social media post or in what, what, whatever, and really just talk about this convergence, talk about our values, recommit to our values, um, and push ourselves forward. So, so these are some of the many ways that, that we, we mobilize and we, we also really follow the lead of um, our, our Muslim, Arab, our Sikh, our South Asian um, advocacy um, partners um, who, who are seeking, uh, you know, multi-faith support. Um, and so, so really that comes depending on, on what is happening at the time. So, um, so that's just very, very briefly, but also perhaps <laughs> a lot all at once, um, what we do, what some of the strategies that, that, that we um, employ in our work. Well, you know, I, I, I really appreciate, I mean, so look, Nina, like, I, I just want to say, like, starting to work with, with Catherine, um, who was the former executive director, you know, years ago, and, and working with you and Cassandra, um, you know, I, I, I've, I've learned so much from all y'all, right? And, and um, you, you all have pushed me sometimes and challenged me, but you've also, you've also helped support, you know, the, the work that, uh, and I, I would not be doing the work, kind of work I'm doing now, I think if I hadn't had a relationship with all y'all. So I just want to say thank you for that, you know, first off. And then I, I think too, um, I've I got to participate in those in those community conversations that you all, you know, lead once a month. And um, it is in a lot of ways uh, because of all the negativity that we hear about in the world. Um, working to counter dehumanization, help build, you know, human beings, uh, you know, into the kind of community we want can be very lonely work. And, and you kind of feel like you're just walking up a, a, a cold mountain stream all the time up to your chest, you know, and, and then you realize that there's other people around the community, around the, around the country doing that work too. And so that, that kind of, that, that has been so powerful. And I think the, the faith over fear trainings that I've been able to participate in and just watching the way um, uh, leaders and also members of, of communities of wisdom coming together to understand a little better, uh, not only the process of dehumanization, which maybe we should talk about just for a minute, but also what our traditions and what you know sociology and other forms of, of human study have taught us about how to counter dehumanization, how to bring us back together again. And because uh, I think there are times in which, um, you know, we, we faith leaders don't always respond, you know, in an effective way to the kind of questions people have, and and the questions come from so many so many different places. It's hard for for leaders to catch up, you know, sometimes. And um, 
so like, like maybe let's just talk about like dehumanization itself just for a moment and then what is it that helps us rehumanize you know each other to ourselves right um so so when you if you have to give me like a, a one minute understanding of dehumanization like how would how would you do that oh that's a that's a tough one um well i think you know drawing from some of what um, our partners share, um, a, a partner organization share, there's this uh, pattern of creating us versus them narratives yeah. and creating a, a very rigid sense of us and a very rigid sense of them yeah. uh, and, and essentially uh, pitting, put, pitting them against each other, um, creating dynamics where, um, you know, they do this because we do this because um, our our motivations are are um, you know um, brave perhaps and and good and their motivations are bad and evil um, uh, you know there's uh, there's just this this basically this very rigid us versus them and it's all within a context um, so 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 that's that's very simply put I think what um, a pattern that essentially uh, uh, leads us towards dehumanization, and and that pattern can be extremely dangerous. And and the more we we fuel it, the more that we um, put into it, the more that we'll lead from just thinking these things to saying these things to doing things that are violent to to condoning it whether that be we witness it or we take part in it, you know, it's just, it just leads us to a, a, a really negative path. Um, so, so that simply put, I would say is, is, is a pattern of dehumanization. Yeah. And I, and I, I think, you know, I, it, it's some, I think about it almost every day. I mean, honestly, Nina, um, and what occurred to me, you know, what occurs to me often is number one, that I'm susceptible to it. I think all of us are susceptible to that process, and in part, uh, dehumanize, dehumanization works because it tries to leverage what we care about and even what we love to say that what we love and care about is threatened by this other group or by these other groups, and that that then becomes a permission structure to say that violence is okay, I don't have to respond to it, um, it's okay if it happens to them. Or even as the as the Buffalo shooter did uh, to to go and engage in violence. I mean, he he was convinced wrongly that that something he loved and cared about was being threatened, and that he needed to do something about it. And that is the the historical pattern not only of individuals but of entire societies. You know, say Jonathan Leader Maynard. You know, and you know, and our, and. Uh, um, so there, there's a lot of, 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 of study out there about that. Well, what, what do our wisdom traditions, you know, how do we, how do we counteract um, this? And, you know, one, one more just, you know, piece that I think is really important. I, I spent some time looking at the Hebrew scripture, um, searching for the word slander. And the word slander, um, like in Ecclesiastes 26, um, it, it says there's four things I'm, I'm scared about, you know, uh, and basically it was a lie, the gathering of a mob, false accusations, and then death. And what is that, you know, but a conversation about dehumanization within a community. And so, and so this is, this is, this is well known by, by, by ancient wisdom traditions. How do we rehumanize ourselves to each other? What are some good strategies there? And I think you've named it organizationally, but I think it would be good for us to say it like in a little more informal way. Sure. I mean, you started by by naming faith values. You know, many of our faith traditions um, uh, lead us to this. Uh, you know, in the Quran, for example, there's. Um, um, uh, you know, I have made you into different nations and tribes so that you may know each other, you know, um, the, the, the concept of Imago Dei, um, that, that, um, uh, we are made in the image of God, you know, there, there are so many, um, faith traditions and, and, and spiritual traditions, um, uh, that, that, that give us insight into each other as, as fellow human beings, um, and, and so I, I feel like there's a lot there. There's a, there's a compass there. 
uh, there's a compass and compassion <laughs> there. Um, and, and, and so, um, I think that's, that's a place that many people find profound to start. Um, but also, you know, I just wanted to, to name, you know, I just was in, in conversation with a colleague the other, um, the other day, um, uh, remembering a professor of mine used to say, uh, what you see depends upon where you've been standing. And, and it's just this reminder that, that, you know, we are, the world is so big and, and we have just such a small perspective in it. Um, and, and remembering that there are so many other perspectives, there are so many stories and histories and families and contexts. And so just, just like reminding ourselves of, of, of our, of how small we are and, and, and how, um, you know, there, there's so much beauty in, in um, stepping outside of what we, of our, our regular kind of viewpoints and stepping into others and, and learning from new perspectives, cross-cultural experiences. Um, there's so much beauty that we can learn from that. So I think that also w- w- helps so much with um, addressing dehumanization. It's, it's kind of stepping into um, other other places um, beyond our comforts, um, beyond the comfort zones of our our regular lives, I'd say. Right, and and that does require kind of a willingness to risk. You know, I remember the first time I went to a mosque. Um, I I just went and showed up. Uh, you know, it was during during some of the really terrible rhetoric of the of Donald Trump's you know campaign, the first campaign, and and I was nervous. You know, because I didn't know if I was going to do something wrong or if I'd offend anybody or how I'd be welcomed. You know, and they 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 welcomed me in. They showed me where to put my shoes. You know, uh, because we're on holy ground in that moment, and and also it saves on lots of rug cleaning costs. You know, for those of you who are cost conscious out there. You know, and then they they gave me a chair and I sat in the back and I I prayed my prayers while they prayed theirs and and uh, they gave me a a bottle of water, you know, they gave me some, some dates to go home with. I mean, they were so, they were so welcoming, but it, it it requires kind of a risk on our part, but I think all of us can, can speak well of, right? So one way to counter false witness or slander against our neighbor is to tell positive, truthful witness. And, you know, part of the methodology that you all teach is like, don't get into baiting stuff. Just tell some positive stories about your American Muslim neighbors, or if you don't have any specific neighbors, like learn some stories of American Muslims that have contributed to our society, right? And then build on some shared values and remind people, kind of take people on a journey a little bit that, you know, you once had a negative attitude as well, and that you recognize you still have some work to do, but then you've, you got to meet someone. And sort of model like how people can begin to move out into those spaces and realize kind of how fascinating and beautiful and enriching it is to engage with people of other traditions. And it doesn't mean you have to step out of your own. It may, it may mean that you'll go deeper into your own because you're understanding that uh, the, the depth of another and, and seeing things in your own tradition you'd, you'd kind of missed, you know. And and I think lastly, Nina, I think there, you know, fear is underneath so much of this. And and if we were to think about it, you know, kind of in Christian terms for a minute, you know, it's not just that everyone is made in the image of God. I mean, that is something that that, that says, but it also means that I am. And just to, to remind people like, okay, so you grew up in a society like I did, in which there's a lot of different bigotries, a lot of different slanders, a lot, a lot of people, a lot of dehumanization. Um, that's kind of not your fault, really. Um, but... Um, you are still made in the image of God. God loves you as you are. And so therefore, like, you don't have to feel bad because somebody else is different, (laughs) you know, and it's, it's such an interesting, um, you know, conversation with people, um, you know, to help them learn in a way kind of what courage it takes to stand with, with our, our neighbors, but also how enriching and how beautiful it is, right, to do that. Totally, totally. And, and I'll just share a story. You know, I was preparing to go um, um, to a faith over fear training in um, a, a smaller rural town in Minnesota, Wilmer, Minnesota. I, you were there. Yeah, uh, I was there. That was great. Yeah. yeah. 
And, and I, um, was, was, was worried. I'll say that I'll just say it. You know, I was nervous, um, you know, in the recent weeks, uh, in the lead up to, to the training, um, uh, neighboring town had made national news for their rise in, in hate group activity. And, um, and, and, and so I was, you know, a sing- traveling alone, uh, you know, and in coming in at night and just nervous, you know, um, and uh, w- what was I heading into, you know, being a woman of color and, and stepping into this town, um, that, that had recently, you know, that, the, that region had recently made national news for, for the growing hate. And, and so I, you know, I, 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 I entered the, the community center there in Wilmer, Minnesota, nervous and was incredibly amazed by the warm welcome. People coming up saying, thank you so much for being here. We saw the national news and we want you to know that's not us. That's not who we are. Um, and that's why we're here. That's why we need this training. And I just remember being my heart being so encouraged and and reminded why this work is so important and why the folks there in Wilmer should know that they're not alone, um, that there is a community, a, a national community, a global community of people who are doing this work and and you know, pushing back against these these harmful narratives that that's not us. That's not who we are. We're better than that. Right. Um, and, and, and so, um, I, 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 don't know that that's the story. I just thought I'd tell that, that even I had that fear and apprehension right. and was, was amazed and, and, you know, by the, by the warmth of this community. Well, and, and the, and the courage there, you know, there, I remember very clearly, I don't remember their names, but I remember very clearly them, the, a young, uh, uh, Lutheran Christian person, right. And a young Muslim person who were friends. And they had the courage, you know, to in, engage with people that were bringing guns to a city council meeting, right? And I also remember, you know, Pastor Mandy France, you know, there, um, who I had, who I heard about and talked with, but had never met, you know, and and she and, and her husband, you know, who had, um, you know, engaged in conversation and relationship with um, an American Muslim doctor, you know, and. And I, I often remind people who who get who hear the negative news, they see the the sensational thing that happens at the city council meeting, or or and they assume that that's happening everywhere. But I, I also remind people that out here in Western Washington, you know, I can name in almost every small town, uh, up and down I five and across I ninety toward Idaho that there are people in every community like doing incredible work and showing courage and like getting up every day. And yes, they go take rest. So they go take a vacation. It's not 24, seven, 365, but they're consistently doing work to uphold human dignity, you know? And um, it is so beautiful to remember that, you know, it is so, so hopeful to remember that. And then I, I, so I think Nina, like another, you know, part of this is, is us, you know, sort of sharing how we see our American Muslim neighbors, you know, responding, you know, to all the levels of dehumanization and, and, um, you know, how, how do you see them responding to all this? Sure. I mean, I, I mean, I just want to step back and say too that you know, American Muslims, they're they're living their lives as we all are. Yes. You know, they're they're having conversations like yeah. these. They're sharing oh, meals yeah. with their families and their neighbors. You know, they're right. engaged in their faith community or the interfaith right. community or community organizations and their schools. You know, they um, are working on issues that impact all of us. You know, like climate change, the pandemic, poverty, women's rights. You know, you name it. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're there. And, and so, um, you know, just as, as this issue impacts, uh, directly impacts American Muslims, you know, they are working on issues that directly impacts all of us. Um, and so, so, so that's, I guess, what I wanted to name. Yeah. Um, for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I, so I, I've, I've seen like the Muslim Association of Puget Sound, you know, they, they do some really excellent, you know, community service there. Um, they've got a free legal clinic for all kinds of folk. They're working on, on hunger issues, on homelessness issues, on, on so many different, and just the way a lot of, you know, parishes or community organizations, you know, work on issues because they care about their neighbors. Um, I've also seen a lot of American Muslims, 
you know, recognize that 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 um, the kind of dehumanization that impacts them is impacting many groups and building, you know, coalitions with all kinds of folk, you know, to stand together because, you know, we either stand together or we fall apart, you know, right. And and there's 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 been a lot of that right now. It's been interesting to, to learn that that a lot of American Muslim women, 50 percent of whom don't wear a hijab and 50 percent who do. That, that that the numbers kind of risen in the last couple of decades because they 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 want to be uh, you know public about their their own tradition and 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 help uh, people to recognize that it is a normal and natural thing you know to to uh, to wear some of the clothing that your tradition uh, in, uh, invites you to consider wearing right um, so I've I've seen an awful lot of courage and I, I I've also seen. Um, Some desire to kind of like keep a lower profile, you know, and just sort of, you know, not not talk as much with folk. But I've really seen since then a, a desire for connection and relationship that I think is incredibly powerful as well. Totally. So, so Nina, you worked in Sri Lanka, you know, to understand uh, interreligious, uh, you know, uh, partnerships and. And but also cultural intercultural conflict. Um, what what did that teach you and, and about um, about this kind of work and how does it inform what you do today? Sure, I'm happy to share. You know, so um, in 2016, I was a Lanka Corps fellow with the Asia Foundation. I had the I was placed to work at, at an organization called the International Center for Ethnic Studies. And I, I had the, the privilege really of accompanying colleagues to many different parts of the country, um, parts of the island to visit and be in conversation with, with Buddhist, Muslim, Hindu, Christian leaders um, and understand their perspectives on interreligious conflict and coexistence. And as you, you may know, Sri Lanka you know, has a long history of, of ethno-religious conflict. Um, uh, a 26 plus year war um, that continues to impact communities today. And, you know, my, my parents, um, they, they witnessed the horrors of, of Black July in 1983, where uh, a particular, uh, you know, Tamil people, um, uh, an ethnic group were, were targeted. Um, and, and the house that my mom was living in at the time was, was my uncle's house. Um, uh, who had a Tamil last name and that house was targeted and burned to the ground. My father worked for a Tamil company and, and that, that company was burned to the ground. And it was, it was awful. They, 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 they got married and, and moved to the United States um, after that. Um, and I had only um, visited Sri Lanka um, um, after the war was declared over um, for the first time in 20, 2009. Um, and 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 then one other time for a cousin's wedding in 2013. So having the chance to to live and work in Sri Lanka um, was really important to me um, for for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, and and then having the ability to to be exposed to learn from different communities within Sri Lanka, learning about the rich diversity of Sri Lanka. Um, was absolutely incredible. Um, and, and so, you know, I, you know, like the U.S., I'll say, you know, Sri Lanka has a, a history that's full of, of diversity and interreligious and, and intercultural relationships and collaborations and, you know, some simple and profound um, examples from, from just witnessing firsthand, you know, seeing a Buddhist and Hindu mother greet their children and greet each other as they're coming home from school, you know, and it's so simple and so profound, you know, the uh, being treated myself with such hospitality um, and care by a Muslim community when I decided uh, to take an overnight bus alone, being the only visibly non-Muslim, non-Sri Lankan national woman traveling alone overnight on a bus, I was treated with such care. Um, you know, I attended a church service that incorporated the three primary languages spoken in Sri Lanka, which Sinhala, Tamil, and English. So these are just some examples of what I was able to witness. And, you know, that I, I see those simple stories here all the time. You know, uh, 
a Methodist church leader leading a book group and educating her congregation about Islam and Muslims, you know, a, an, a book study bringing in Muslim speakers from the community or, you know, a rabbi um, speaking out in solidarity with Muslim friends after an anti-Muslim display at a state capitol. Um, you know, an evangelical Christian in Kentucky coordinating interfaith dinners for refugees and, and welcoming refugees in their community uh, with partnership of, of other churches and, and synagogues and mosques. Um, you know, that's just a few of those simple stories. You know, uh, um, there was um, uh, uh, someone who, who witnessed uh, a, and, and was a part of a drive-by racist attack um, with her daughter um, after just moving to the, to the, to the country as a, as a refugee. Um, and, and she made it her mission to show her daughter that the American people were better than that. And she, along with her neighbors, they, they started this, this uh, um, uh, yard sign, um, a, a kind of tradition, all are welcome here. And it was in multiple languages. And maybe you've seen that in your neighborhoods too. And, yeah. uh, you know, that was just a powerful display of solidarity. So, so things like that, that um, I saw in Sri Lanka and that I, I see today, I think, are so important to, to remember. There's so much, there's so much hope around us. And that's, and that, that's part of how, I mean, we, we do see, I, I think, a, um, I, I see a society right now in the United States where trust, you know, in, in, in the broad, on the part of many individuals toward the larger society uh, toward the institutions of the society is is very low and dangerously low, and and that isn't to say. I mean, I've heard I've heard a lot of people say, well, things feel like they're falling apart. Well, they they never were particularly together, <laughs> right? You know, so there's a ton of racist ideas and policies and attitudes and actions and historical trauma as the result of all that, right? But I I think we are at a moment where people feel like our whole society is kind of fragile and could move toward this kind of, you know, intergroup violence, right? But I also see incredible signs of hope, you know, partly because there's a lot of people that are concerned about that, right? And there's a lot of people that are doing a whole lot about it. So in this work that you do, Nina, um, where are you finding hope today? Sure, I think the biggest source of hope and joy in my life it has been my my child, my my toddler, um, Ayan, and and you know he's just he's so funny and and cuddly and sweet and you know yeah. just he's been surrounded by love his entire life. He's only twenty one months years old, you know twenty one months old, <laughs> and um, yeah. you know his experiencing of the world, exploring nature, discovering you know how to open doors and latches and you know, learning new words and songs, you know, that inspires me to see all the good, all the, all the hope around us. And I was, I was thinking about this the other day, you know, with, with my husband, you know, he's going to inevitably experience pain and suffering um, and, you know, maybe being bullied or, or harmed, or, you know, he'll learn about the injustices and the wrongs of, of our world and maybe witness that, or maybe be even experience that himself, um, you know, and, and I hope that, that he also is reminded to see the beauty and the hope around um, as well, you know, when he inevitably experiences and, and learns about all the injustices. Um, and, and so, you know, he is reminding me to see that hope now. And, and I hope that he also does that himself <laughs> um, as he grows. And, and, you know, I think, you know, remembering to see the wonder um, and, you know, that, that children remind us, um, that, that connect us to each other. I think that's, what's bringing me hope. That's what brings me hope. And, and, um, yeah. <laughs> that's incredible. It's an incredible gift, uh, you know, to be a parent, um, and to experience the world through your child's senses, you know, whatever those senses are. Right. Mm -hmm. And to see that, that, that lack of fear that they experience and, of course, you know, you know, this week that we're recording this, you know, as you said earlier, we're we're thinking about the the terrible shooting in Texas, you know, and and the the grief and pain. And I think, you know, part of our of our you know common human experience is is loss and grief. 
And I try to remind people too, that as they're engaging with people that are different, well, there's, there's incredible trauma that folk have experienced. There's lots of loss that folk have had. And um, that is also something that that binds and unites us, uh, as well as a, a desire for a better world, you know, and um, I just, I so appreciate, you know, Nina, the, the work that you do, and the way you do it, the way you listen, the way you partner with people um, in different communities to, to, um, and, and, and listen in such a way that, you know, you really are being a, an effective ally, you know, as that community or as that person needs on that day, right? I, I just so, so deeply appreciate that. And, and it's just a, an honor to be on this, uh, be a small part of the journey that, that Shoulder to Shoulder is on, that we're on as a, as a country and to be able to walk that with you and, and Cassandra and, and all the others at Shoulder to Shoulder. And so um, how can people get connected to, and I just wanna encourage people to, to support financially and through prayer and through participation in the work of shoulder to shoulder and how, how can they get in touch with all y'all? Thanks so much, Terry. Terry, it's a real privilege to be able to work with you and to, to stay connected in all the work that you're doing uh, in, in Washington state and really beyond uh, through paths to understanding. Um, uh, so so to, to be able to stay connected to our work at shoulder to shoulder, um, you know, the, the simple way is to join our mailing list. It's, it's on our website, click join us and, and sign up and, and you'll learn more about our work and different opportunities um, to, to um, connect and, 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 you know, uh, whether they be events or um, updates in the work, um, follow us on social media. We, we try to share a mixture of informative um, information, um, um, you know, stories that, that are hard um, as well as stories of hope. Um, and so um, follow us on our different channels and, and really always feel free to connect with, with us, with our staff. Um, just reach out. We're just an email away. And if we don't have the answer, we're, we're always ready to point you to people who, who, might, who might have them themselves. Thank you, Nina. And I, I get your email too. And uh, although I recently did unsubscribe because I have too many email addresses. So I unsubscribed from two of them, but I, but I just, it's because I wanted to get the one. So um, I'm so, I'm so thankful uh, for all of our, for your time today and for all of our work together and for the work that you all continue in this world as part of this like multi-faith partnership, you know, trying to trying to push back on an anti-Muslim bigotry, knowing that that's one way to push back on all the bigotries, right? That's a, that's a part of our, of our common understanding. So I want to thank all of you for listening today. I want to thank Nina for joining us. Um, all the Paths to Understanding podcasts um, can be found on major podcasting services. You can learn more about us at pathstounderstanding.org. We have an extensive YouTube channel where all of these episodes, as well as our Challenge 2.0 uh, television show with Jeff Renner um, can be found. And until we, we see you again, be well, be calm, and be good to your neighbors.